good morning, uh, dear guests, so, and good evening in Japan time. Uh, this is our and uh, today, and uh, this topic is uh, today the economic cooperation and investment between Hungary and Japan, and it is an honor to have our uh, guests uh, with us who will take part uh, in this uh, in this uh, uh, discussion panel. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, Professor uh, Watanabe. Uh, Yuri Zumi, Professor, uh, Dean of the School of International Communication uh, from the Kansai University of International Studies, uh, having uh, a long history uh, with uh, the topics of the Europe uh, and Japan economic uh, cooperation. Uh, our uh, other guest uh, from Japan, but actually physically from Budapest, uh, Mr. Suairo Toru, the General Director of the Japan External Trade organization uh, and uh, he actually he is the, the head of office uh, here in Budapest of, of Jetro. Uh, our guest uh, from Hungary is uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chaba Moldic, a college professor from the Budapest Business School uh, dealing uh, with uh, Southeast Asian and, and Far East economic uh, studies. Uh, our uh, associate uh, research fellow at the institute, <clears throat> and uh, our, res our uh, research fellow, senior analyst, uh, Mr. Peter Goretsky, uh, the manager of external economics and Eastern markets program at our institute, Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade uh, here in Hungary, Budapest. And uh, myself, I am Laszlo Vasa, the senior research fellow and chief advisor of the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, once again, thank you very much for uh, accepting our invitation for this event, and uh, we are very happy to have so many uh, uh, participants um, uh, from outside who are interested for our event today. This event is part of an event series uh, uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, Japan and Central uh, uh, Euro connections after the COVID uh, era. We hope that uh, we can encourage uh, uh, an interesting uh, discussion uh, and discovering some tendencies and uh, opportunities uh, for the Japan, Hungarian, and uh, Central European uh, connection. Technically, our speakers uh, will uh, make a, a key, a key, a kind of keynote. Uh, uh, using uh, some PowerPoint slides. And thereafter, we will discuss uh, uh, some issues based uh, on questions. And at the end of the session, the audience will have the chance to raise questions in a form of uh, sending a message uh, in the chat function. So thank you very much again. And now we would like to start our session. Uh, Professor Watanabe, uh, I ask you uh, firstly to uh, to uh, make your keynote. So the, the floor is yours. Uh, you can share uh, your thoughts and your PowerPoint uh, slide with us. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Yori Watanabe. Uh, has been introduced. I'm a professor at a university in Osaka, but I. Uh, spent some time with uh, Keio University in Tokyo. And maybe some of you are aware of that, that name. Um, you see, Hungary is uh, one of the few countries amongst the member states of the European Union that I have never been to. It's a great shame, you see. So uh, I wish uh, I could come uh, to your country one day, but uh, my... Um, personal uh, spiritual attachment uh, to Hungary is really uh, to great extent. Why? Because I have been educated by uh, Jesuit priests, you know, priests of the Society of Jesus. And uh, I, uh, I owe very much to two um, Hungarian uh, priests. Uh, one is uh, prof uh, Professor and Reverend Father Nemeshegi. That's a typical uh, Hungarian name. And also another uh, Reverend Father is uh, Father Nemesh. 
And so Father Nemesh and Nemeshegi uh, both are the professors of uh, philosophy uh, de uh, department of Sofia University, that is Jesuit University in Tokyo. And I learned a lot from them. So with my uh, sincere thanks to those two uh, Reverend Fathers, um, I would like to make a very humble contribution to today's uh, uh, today's um, uh, gathering uh, symposium on cooperation and investment between Japan and Hungary. And at the outset, I should like to be um, I should like to be uh, uh, expressing my sincere thanks uh, to the organizer uh, and organizers, the Institute uh, for Foreign Affairs and Trade (IFAT) uh, of uh, of Hungary, and all uh, those people who have been involved in, in the preparations. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, get into the substance. And uh, uh, well, actually, I have been a uh, rather practitioner of uh, uh, trade uh, negotiations, trade agreements uh, in the past. So uh, on the basis of that, I'd like to just uh, explain to you what is the basic sort of idea and concept of Japanese uh, trade policy uh, of recent years. So in order to uh, get into uh, uh, some you know, details, I'd like to first uh, go to the uh, first slide. Can you uh, see the slide? Uh, I'm sure that Mr. Chairman uh, will be administrating my slide. Uh, yeah, is I that the case? See. I can you, you see, can see the now. Okay, very good. You, you can see the, uh, the audience can also share the document. Uh, which is showing the Great Britain, the island of Great Britain, and also uh, the I table. Can, sorry, we cannot see yet. Uh, oh, did you? Oh, you can't see it. Uh, I thought you are administrating uh, my slide. Okay, okay sure. You, I should. You mean I should? Uh... Yeah, uh, because from my side, I cannot uh, deal with oh, okay, the, those okay, okay, uh, slides. Okay. Can no you? Problem show the audience yes the, yes yes the, I'm the first right uh, slide uh, yeah. after the uh, uh, yes the title ones uh, slide number two that's showing uh, great britain the island of great britain and uh, the table uh, yes now it's appearing yes very good uh, thank you very much mr chairman that is the one that i want to share with you first because that is to show you uh, uh, to what extent uh, the brexit uh, mattered uh, for for japan uh, you you see the names of all representative japanese uh, companies like toyota sony nissan canon hitachi toshiba rico all that uh, you are quite familiar with and you see the dot, dots on the Great Britain Island. Uh, those are the uh, production site of those uh, Japanese companies. And for instance, the company, uh, vehicle company uh, Nissan uh, employs 8,000 people and more than 80% of uh, Nissan's UK production goes on to the continental uh, European member states. Um, now we have uh, EU-UK uh, trade agreement so the damage has been uh, mitigated and the uh, damage has been, uh, we believe, that minimized thanks to this uh, uh, UK-EU uh, trade agreement. Uh, but uh, why Brexit matters to Japan, the country in the Far East, uh, you see that our cause uh, is there, you see. So maybe after the uh, Brexit, after the UK departure from the European Union, I think other member states of the European Union would like to see any, uh, you know, replacing opportunities that has been uh, uh, enjoyed by Great Britain, you see. So uh, maybe that could give you some idea. The next slide uh, showing again, the, uh, those, those are the uh, uh, Japanese auto producers production sites and also uh, sites for research and development. Um, you see a number of uh, Japanese uh, uh, automotive companies uh, located in, uh, in Europe, within the European Union. So uh, some of them are indicated uh, in, uh, in Hungary as well, you see. So uh, this has a quite big operation, 13, 14 plants in uh, eight countries amongst the EU, 
uh, 27 member, uh, 28 member countries it used to be, and uh, a number of research and development centers employing uh, nearly 150,000 uh, people. Uh, so that's a great uh, sort of contribution to uh, European uh, Union's economy. Uh, I would certainly think in that way. And the next slide, uh, pay, uh, slide number four, uh, is uh, to, to indicate to you how uh, Japanese uh, uh, Economic Partnership Agreement, EPA, that is basically FTA, how Japanese FTA policy has been developed. And uh, the most important turning point was the uh, Praza Agreement of September 1985, where Japanese uh, uh, yen, the Japanese currency, has been largely appreciated. So in order to mitigate the negative impact of uh, appreciation of Japanese yen, the many Japanese manufacturers, including those companies uh, making parts and components of cars and uh, electronics and all that, uh, they moved out from Japan to produce uh, the parts and components uh, in the respective neighboring countries in ASEAN and later uh, China, the mainland China and others. So you see the, uh, those uh, small uh, items, parts and components being produced in Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia and other countries, uh, but still Japan uh, produces the high value added uh, engine parts and components, uh, exporting them to uh, those respective ASEAN countries. And those parts and components are moving from one country to another, adding new value added. And uh, uh, the final production would be done in Thailand, for instance, that is a, in the case of uh, uh, Nissan's March, the smallest uh, subcompact car uh, Nissan has been producing, uh, but the engine parts coming from, from Japan. You see, so that developed uh, what I would call de facto business driven integration. So in order to give uh, more substance to this de facto business driven integration and consolidate uh, the, you know, the good things about this de facto business driven integration, uh, the uh, Japanese companies uh, put the pressure on Japanese government to uh, create uh, the economic partnership agreement, a kind of legal instrument, a uh, legal device to foster further investment uh, to the neighboring countries and uh, establishing the what we would call the value chain uh, as a part of a production network. So next uh, slide uh, is showing you know what really happened. Uh, if, if you see the ex example one, a Japanese automobile company based in Thailand imports engines and transmissions from Japan, assembles them in Thailand and uh, exports them to Australia, New Zealand, etc. Example three is about uh, elevator uh, machinery, a Japanese elevator manufacturer based in Thailand, imports hoists from China, manufactures elevators in Thailand and exports them to India. You see, so uh, that's the uh, the way that uh, kind of de facto business driven integration has been developed into the uh, value chain with the help of establishing de jure uh, institutional arrangements such as FTA and EPA. So the summary of that kind of picture is uh, provided in the next uh, slide. Um, Yes, market integration in Asia Pacific. You see the Praza Accord, uh, September 85, was a ignition key. And the de facto business driven integration developed into the jure uh, institution uh, led integration with FTA EPA. Now, not only bilateral FTA EPAs, we have the uh, wider regional FTAs like uh, ASEAN plus one. Uh, one uh, means uh, maybe Japan or maybe China, maybe the Republic of Korea. So ASEAN plus uh, one, and there are five different ASEAN plus one. And we have also ASEAN plus three, that's a three. Uh, by that we mean China, uh, Korea, and Japan. And our, uh, ASEAN plus six, uh, so in addition to ASEAN plus three, uh, there would be three more countries like Australia, New Zealand, and uh, India. 
And that is, sorry, I, I just ignore this telephone call. You see, somebody is calling me at this university, but um, uh, sorry, sorry for this disturbance. But anyway, this ASEAN plus six uh, became RCEP. RCEP uh, is also very important uh, endeavors uh, that uh, uh, East Asians are doing now. Uh, RCEP uh, is a Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, RCEP. And that has been signed uh, 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 this year. And uh, uh, sorry, RCEP has been signed last year in December. And now we are expecting that they would be uh, coming into force, but unfortunately without India, you see. Uh, I got five minutes to go. So you see, uh, this is the uh, way that Japan has been uh, developing. Uh, the uh, uh, regional integration, market integration in Asia, but we go beyond, that's TPP. And uh, uh, TPP stands for Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And uh, after US departure, uh, Japan uh, stood firm, stood firm uh, to go on and, uh, and keep momentum of trade uh, liberalism in the, uh, uh, the region of Asia Pacific. Uh, so CPTPP, uh, you know, after U.S. departure, uh, we concluded uh, this uh, new version of TPP. And now we have Japan EU uh, EPA. Uh, now uh, we are celebrating the second anniversary of Japan EU EPA. And uh, uh, we have this EPA is accompanied with SPA, Strategic Partnership Agreement. Uh, it's a kind of political endeavor agreement uh, that has been also uh, uh, coming uh, coming into force. We have Japan UK EPA uh, recently uh, coming into force. So all together, so all together. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'd like to show you. Uh, this is the list of Japanese bilateral EPAs together with uh, Japan EU EPA, Japan US Trade Agreement in on goods, Japan UK Economic Partnership Agreement. Uh, so there are uh, uh, 15 to 16 uh, bilaterals plus TPP plus RCEP and all that. The so next slide is showing uh, the components of Japanese EPA, not only FTA, the traditional market access liberalization part in trading goods and services, but those are complemented by government procurement, movement of natural persons, competition policy, business environment, improving that, uh, bilateral cooperation and very importantly uh, investment chapter uh, which is uh, uh, containing uh, also the uh, uh, the uh, dispute settlement uh, in regard of investment um, next slide is showing some uh, kind of ideal idea uh, that I wanted to share with you so on the basis of those bilateral EPAs we got to go to uh, directions. I think you could um, uh, go uh, an to another uh, uh, slide uh, after that. Uh, yes, yes, yes. This this is the one that I'm now talking about. You see, so uh, to the direction of East Asia, we have RCEP. RCEP is basically ASEAN plus six, but uh, the India has been dropped. So now it's ASEAN plus five, 15 nations. And uh, that covers the even Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. So uh, this is more kind of uh, aiming at inclusive growth. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, the Pacific Rim Agreement, that is TPP or Japan-US bilateral. And uh, uh, actually this is more uh, lure-oriented one and high level market access regulatory convergence and harmonization, those are the elements that usually uh, performed by developed countries. And those two streams, one is uh, RCEP in the East Asia, and the other is TPP and Japan US in the Pacific Rim, uh, will be merged into FTAAP, that's the free trade area of Asia Pacific. In other words, it's a FTA, uh, of APEC regions. APEC is 21 member economy. Um, it's a um, framework to uh, foster trade liberalization and investment liberalization. So uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, Japan is now well 
uh, equipped with those um, bilateral EPAs and also interregional EPAs. And uh, next slide, uh, yes, you are showing the right uh, uh, slide here. Uh, we have three mega regions like Europe centered around EU, and we have uh, NAFTA or successor of NAFTA USMCA agreement uh, in Americas. Uh, but go down to the south, we have Mercosur or Alianza del Pacifico. Uh, those are the Americas. And across the Pacific, we have East Asia. And East Asia, we have RCEP. And uh, between East Asia and Americas, we have TPP, uh, US-Japan bilateral agreement. And uh, between EU and East Asia, we have Japan and EU EPA. And most probably, uh, under Mr. Biden, we would have TTIP negotiation to be res resumed again. So it's concluding remarks. Uh, so uh, we have untapped potentiality between Japan and EU, but the more uh, notably between Japan and Hungary. So TPP 12 as a template for 21st century trade agreements, TPP 11, CPTPP to keep momentum for freer trade in Asia Pacific, RCEP, JCK, FTA. JCK stands for Japan, China, Korea, trilateral FTA for updating the production network in East Asia. Japan, EU, EPA, the major interregional mega FTA connecting East Asia and EU via Japan. And Japan, UK, EPA to minimize the damage, uh, damage caused by the Brexit. So all together, you see, the Japan is ready to work with uh, Hungary and uh, hope that uh, we could uh, make a better sort of enhancement of trade liberalization to realize the economic welfare to the maximum point uh, and keep trade multilateralism embodied in the WTO and thus to maintain predictability in international business. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's 16 minutes, so one minute uh, 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 excessive one. So sorry for that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, we got a really exciting uh, overview on the international context of the Japan trade, Japanese trade policy, which is uh, affecting and providing the framework for the relations with Hungary. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, Praise is all mine. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and all the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, after, after the international context, uh, Mr. Suahiro uh, will provide us an overview on, on, the, on the JETRO's uh, related activities in connection with Japan and Hungary. Uh, Mr. Suahiro, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, thank you very much, me, Professor Basha. Uh, my name is Suahiro. Uh, just arrived to the Bukale, uh, Budapest on this uh, first of December. So I stay in Budapest just for two months and a half. Uh, but the uh, first assignment in this region was about 30 years ago, or uh, uh, 25 years ago in neighboring country, Romania. Uh, so I'm uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, the member of the, in the JETRO, uh, the member of the East and Central European countries. So uh, starting from my position, I will share the PowerPoint. Can you see it? Yes. Then yes, uh, see. you see it? Yes, we see. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I should uh, introduce the JETRO itself. Uh, JETRO is one of the Japanese semi-governmental organization uh, to, for promoting the, and also the enhancing the global business between among Japanese companies and the foreign companies. And the JETRO Budapest uh, was started its activities since 1991. And uh, we are promoting the business between Japan and Hungary. And uh, uh, as you know, that uh, Japanese are rather, how can I say, uh, conservative to do the new business. So uh, for our JETRO's activities, uh, we will provide uh, some uh, information uh, of the company's policy uh, for the global business uh, as a surveillance report. 
since 2002. So today, uh, just two weeks before, uh, January 29th, uh, we launched the latest version of this report. So I will share with this result uh, with you. Uh, so starting for the first page, uh, this is the page that the future policy uh, to the overseas business expansion. Uh, basically about the three or the midterm uh, vision, how do you think about the business in the following action? Then uh, you can see the upper uh, graph, uh, the dark blue one is the existing factory or company and future expansion. And the uh, uh, bright blue one, uh, this is uh, not having the, their uh, factory, the office in abroad that intend to begin. And then black side is the maintain uh, their business or considering the downside or closing. And the last part is no investment plan. The, according to these figures, you can show oh, from 2013 to 2019, uh, almost all uh, image of companies has the positive uh, to the expansion of their business for, uh, abroad. Uh, you see the black, uh, dark and white, uh, bright uh, blue one, uh, since 2013 to 2019, almost about 56% of the companies are expanding. But uh, due to this corona pandemic, uh, the latest one uh, is unfortunately going down. Uh, you see the uh, expansion of the current uh, existing factory, it comes uh, 13% to 19%, about 10 points are down. But uh, you can see the brighter blue one, uh, the intent to begin, not having the uh, company, the uh, factory in the road, but to plan to uh, begin the newly uh, founding new uh, business in foreign, uh, uh, foreign countries are relatively same, uh, almost 25%, uh, just 0.7% decreasing. So it means uh, the intention to starting the new business abroad are still uh, active. Uh, downsides are divided into the large scale and the uh, SMEs. Yosh. Then next slide, uh, this is just mentioned about Vietnam, but uh, this is, I, I would like to say that, uh, uh, what is the motivation to choose the new uh, investment of load? Uh, actually, Japan is located in Asia. So uh, we will uh, first uh, come into the China or Thailand and Vietnam. So uh, we will uh, share the, this uh, motivation, uh, what is the, key factor to decide which country does a Japanese company decide to invest. Uh, first, you can see the China and also the Vietnam. It's mentioned uh, also in the Thailand. Uh, the top priority is the market size and the growth potential. So this shows that the business, uh, about 30 years ago, 1980s, uh, many Japanese companies uh, come to the foreign uh, investment as a uh, uh, hunting uh, or the uh, looking for the cheaper labor force. But now uh, we change our mind uh, from the cheaper labor force to the market. So, so uh, sorry, we are looking for, hello? sorry, probably uh, you forgot to to switch the slides uh, because we are still by the number one slide. Maybe uh, I did, but uh, sorry. So could you? Share your uh, side to this PowerPoint, okay? Uh, should I? Should I? Uh, uh, I try to share it. Sorry. Sorry. No. Uh, in, in my uh, screen, already changed. Oh, okay. Uh, now let's see. Okay, then I. I start to share. So no, no, you mean this yeah. slide? Yes, yes, yes. So yes. now I am thank sharing. You. Please tell me. Please tell me when to when to change the. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank my you. My computer now. Okay. 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 
then uh, so this is the fact that uh, what is the factor to how to choose the country uh, to decide the investment site uh, of course uh, the japan is located in asia so we will choose uh, much uh, uh, better than the uh, europe or america but uh, uh, in Asian countries, this is a uh, topic, so factors they what they choose. And this is also the same uh, mentality of the idea of the Japanese decide which country do we uh, choose in the uh, Europe or the Central and Eastern European countries. And uh, come to the next slide, please. Then uh, this is also the future procurement policy. Uh, basically, uh, that I mentioned before the uh, previous slide, that uh, we were looking for the location as a market. It means they are producing some, some products in this market, so they have to have the same uh, parts of procurement. Uh, so you can see it, uh, we were located in the left side as a for, for the future local products, I mean, the, uh, from procurement from the country itself and then central segment uh, procurement from the uh, EU countries and the right side is from the UK. Uh, this is some, uh, something like a question uh, from the, uh, in the viewpoint of Brexit also. Then you can see uh, the, from local procurement and also procurement from the, within the EU, uh, the top the parameter is from the EU, and the second parameter from the West Europe, and the third parameter central and the Eastern, ah, no, 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 sorry, sorry. The same, yeah, and then, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. And the, you can see in the Western Europe is almost about 20% to 30% uh, that they will uh, increase the procu local procurement or the procurement from the EU side. But the third segment, you can see, uh, from the Central and the Eastern Europe, uh, many companies are uh, uh, increased their intention to the procurement from the Central and Eastern Europe at the 40%, almost half of the companies are looking for intent to increase their procurement from the Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, of course, you can see the right side, UK, uh, rather uh, they are Brexit, so rather uh, decreasing uh, their intention to increase it, but uh, almost all this, almost stay and stay uh, uh, the condition. Okay, come to the next slide. Then uh, this is the sales destination trend. Uh, since 13th, uh, 2013, we are asking to the Japanese companies, where is the next coming promising sales destination? And then on 13, 2013, the top rank, uh, the, uh, you, uh, uh, the Russia and Turkey. And in Hungary, you can see the uh, 56 companies. But uh, within these uh, seven years, uh, top rank is come to the Poland. Second is Germany, but third, uh, we, Hungary. And the, the decreasing of the uh, hope of the sales destination uh, from the uh, Russia and Turkey comes to about one third. Rum uh, Poland, almost the same, 160 to 175. Germany, rather decreasing, but the, still 131. And in Hungary, you can see 50, 56 to 130, about uh, 1.4, 140 percent increase. So this is very uh, big uh, chance for us. And the maybe uh, this is the uh, reason why the location of the Hungary is really center of the Europe. So it's very easy to access and also easy to uh, deliver to the others. And then recently, uh, we have the stable uh, growth of the economy. So that is also the one reason why the many Japanese companies are looking for the Hungary. But so come to the next slide. So how uh, does the Japanese companies choose the next location of the investment. And this is the uh, operational challenge I mentioned that uh, the 
to, to second page, which I just mentioned that uh, what is the advantage, how to choose uh, the Japanese company to uh, select uh, the which country do we locate. But this is what is the uh, negative factor or the, what is the uh, obstacle to running our business in each country. And uh, you can see the top rank, uh, rapid labor cost growth. Uh, in Hungary, you may know that uh, in this, uh, since I remember 16, 2016, about uh, over 10% of the increase of the uh, labor cost. This is rather hard for the Japanese company to keep their business in each location. And uh, of course, uh, you can see this, uh, compared with the 2019, about the 10 points are decreasing. And also the number three, securing the human resources. Uh, these two, so in the viewpoint of the Japanese company to uh, find the location, uh, the, the human resources, this is a very a big factor. So uh, we would like to discuss maybe with the uh, uh, Hungarian government that how to uh, secure the good and uh, uh, relatively enough uh, human resources. Uh, this is a point to choose uh, the location of the investment, I suppose. So other facts that you, you, you may see after that, but uh, basically this is the uh, uh, idea. And uh, first, I, I forgot to mention that uh, many Japanese companies are looking for the new business under this uh, corona pandemic. Uh, the, this global business is rather sustained to the shrinking. So existing business, they are considering to, how can I say, uh, keep it. But uh, the, almost one year ago, uh, the China has a big problem and the many Japanese companies faced with the uh, uh, breaking of the, their global network or global value chain. So uh, we are, they are now thinking to uh, separate or spread out their uh, key factories in not only the concentrate the a certain country, but uh, separate to the each country. So this is also the uh, one factor for how to choose the country. Then uh, this is my last uh, position that uh, uh, what is a good point uh, to cooperate between Hungary and Japan is uh, Japan, uh, the currently uh, pre, uh, Prime Minister Mr. Suga uh, mentioned that uh, by 2035, uh, Japanese country will uh, looking for the uh, zero emission. Uh, maybe uh, this is not a good word, but uh, uh, green say, business. So uh, in Hungary, uh, we also now we concentrate the EV or the green economy. So this is a maybe good uh, chance to cooperate between Hungary and Japan, I suppose. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Soeiro san, uh, for your uh, really interesting approach on our topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting uh, to see the expectations uh, of, of the Japanese companies. And I am especially happy that we have so good position on, uh, on this uh, ranking dynamics uh, uh, when it comes to uh, the preferences of the, of the Japanese companies in the European region. Now I would like to ask uh, Professor Mordit uh, to share his thoughts with us and his PPT. Uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Mordit, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, uh, uh, distinguished uh, members of this uh, panel discussion and also the attendees. And when it comes to the attendees, I must mention that I really uh, appreciate that uh, my students also visit uh, this uh, discussion because you must know that during the times the same time slot i have a lecture at the university at the budapest business school and the title of the course is world economy and international trade and we start with adam smith and i thought this is a good idea that to have the practical side the modern side the the recent changes yeah what we can see in this special case as a kind of case studies in the Hungarian and Japanese uh, 
uh, relations. So I'd like to share uh, the, 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 the PPT, which is not long, I promise. Uh, uh, okay, can you see it? Okay, uh, you are muted, and that's why I cannot hear the reaction, but anyway. Uh, so, game changes in Hungarian Japanese economic relations. So, when preparing for this talk, I, I, I talked to one of my colleagues, and he said that uh, he does not envy me for this talk because it hasn't changed too much, he argued. Yeah, because, uh, and he argued, and he was right about that when saying, that Hungarian and Japanese uh, trade and investment relations uh, are very well established. Yeah, I mean, if you think of the history, definitely Japan was the first Asian country uh, to invest in Hungary, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't mean that, that we have well established uh, uh, connections or relations that nothing changes. Yeah? Moreover, what I try to, to somehow collect here is rather questions related to the future, because there are huge changes coming, in my opinion. So as a, as, as a first step, I simply looked at the last trade data that you can uh, have access. And that's, as you can see, the trade data from January, November, compared to the corresponding period of uh, 2019. So 2020 actually compared to 2019. And we all know that, that the economic crisis uh, caused by the COVID-19 has had huge and negative impact on uh, trade uh, in the world. And this is not surprising if you look at the first two lines that you can see that there is a definite decline. However, if you go further, you can immediately see that the Asian relation or the Asian a region and the, uh, and the trade, both export and import, uh, behave differently. And what I did then, then I looked at the three main uh, partners, yeah, when it comes to Asia. And Hungary's uh, uh, export, as you could see, it could be in increased by almost 7% during this period. However, the import went back, which let's be honest, was good for, for, for the Hungarian balance because traditionally we are having, uh, we are running uh, a trade deficit in the trade with, uh, with Japan. So as you can see, the balance was uh, around 500 million euro. Uh, Korea is a special case. So please don't be misled by these uh, export by increase by, by 20, 6, 27 percent, because if you look at the actual numbers, these are really, really small. And this is the reason why actually at the end we have a so huge uh, trade deficit when it comes to Korea, yeah? because at the same time, Korea uh, imported a lot to Hungary. And this is no surprise if you look at the recent Korean investments in Hungary. Uh, uh, and uh, in, in the first stage, you have this kind of imports needed to start the foreign direct investments the, to the production sites. And when it comes to China, this is again different, more stable in that sense that we still running and we are going more likely to run uh, trade deficits. Uh, but, but this is not surprise, but we were able actually in every connection or in, in every relation to increase our exports, which I would say this is the good news, uh, at least for the Hungarian uh, point of view. So uh, what are the game changers? Obviously, EU-Japan trade agreement from uh, 2019, this is one. Uh, until now, we could hear much more and more in detail about the different uh, uh, trade agreements of uh, Japan. Uh, one of them is obviously the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which was signed at the end of, of uh, two, uh, uh, 2020. Hungary is not part of that, I know, but at the same time, the, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership does have or want to have unified rules of origin, which can facilitate 
the emerge of new regional supply chains that might be not that positive uh, to the Hungarian trade. So there are pros and cons. And we also have a political deal on the China-EU Comprehensive Investment Agreement from the end of uh, 2020, December actually, uh, which is again is not related to Japan, but indirectly there, there might have an effect in that sense that give a boost to have a more comprehensive agreement or deal related to, to an investment agreement in the relation between the European Union and Hungary. So what we can see is definitely this huge changes are coming. Yeah? And obviously, if you look back uh, and you analyze the last year, so the disruptive factor, the COVID-19 must be mentioned yeah? because otherwise uh, the, there is no analysis without that. And here I would like also a little bit include foreign policy uh, aspects as well, because we had, this is clear that we have growing political tensions in the world. On the one hand, China, on the other hand, you have uh, the United States, Japan is a strong ally of the United States. And regardless of that, it's very clear that in a world where most of the manufacturing output still comes from China, around 30% of the global manufacturing output comes from China, uh, it makes sense to reconsider our supply chains. And there are reshoring attempts, reshoring attempts everywhere in the world, meaning reshoring, bring home manufacturing from China uh, in order to, to avoid this kind of uh, supply chain disruptions that we could witness. And that's what we can see in, uh, in Japan, we can see in Taiwan, in Korea, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and in other countries in other countries in the world. So, and there is a slight hope, at least in, in because I'm quite optimistic that, that somehow some of the resharing attempts or this reshoring could affect Hungary in that sense that some of the foreign direct investments could be somehow diverted into the direction of Hungary. So my, Hungary might benefit from that. There's a slight chance, I know, uh, but we should do everything to attract in, in this point, in this special environment, uh, Japanese uh, foreign direct investments. It is very, very positive, I would say, the trade with Japan, investment from Japan and in the other direction does not involve any geopolitical risks. So the, the thing we are, we are speaking of is, is that we have to like-minded countries that sharing the same values, and there are no problems in this uh, uh, relation. So this is a positive thing. And obviously it, it can, at the end of the day, give a boost to trade and investment, definitely. Yeah. And when you look at the foreign policy uh, aspects, then you could argue that the US involvement in EU-China relations, in Hungary-China relations might make the Japanese relations even more valuable than, than it is right now. So that's why I don't argue, I, I, I just hope that these reshoring attempts that you can see around in the world uh, can put Hungary somehow in a better position when attracting FDI from Japan, actually not only from Japan, but from other countries as well, yeah. So this is, this is, let's say, the game changer that I can see at this moment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Moritz, for uh, your uh, comments and, and uh, setting uh, the topic into context of, of the game changer issues. Uh, and now I would like to ask our uh, senior analyst, uh, Mr. Goretsky, uh, uh, to uh, to make his uh, keynote, and uh, following uh, his uh, his speech, we will we will continue with our discussion based on some questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laszlo, for for passing me the the virtual floor. Uh, good morning, everyone, and then good afternoon for those colleagues who uh, joined this uh, event uh, from Japan. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to participate uh, in this in this discussion. And I was very glad to, uh, to listen to Suahiro's presentation. 
because uh, he was talking a lot about uh, those factors that uh, determine how Japanese companies locate a new FDI project uh, in the world. And I would like to talk about a similar topic, but from a strong Hungarian perspective. So what can Hungary offer for, uh, for Japanese companies and what is the, let's say, the Japanese FDI landscape today uh, in, in Hungary? So very briefly, I'm going to talk about Hungary as an investment location, which Japanese companies are uh, considered to be the major investors and what are the uh, prospects uh, for the future. I also have prepared some slides to make my comment more visual, so I will try to start uh, sharing my screen. I hope I will succeed. Okay, we can see, yes. Is it okay? <clears throat> yeah. Perfect. Okay, so first a few words about Hungary as an investment location. Uh, so from the early 1990s, uh, from the poli when the political changes were uh, ongoing, Hungary was successful in attracting uh, FDI projects, building on the, let's say, golden combination of uh, offering a very favorable geographic location plus uh, cost-effective uh, labor pool. Uh, Hungary is located in the heart of the European uh, continent, uh, at, uh, and it's a major transportation junction in the region. So it's quite attractive for uh, regional uh, distribution centers and for those manufacturing activities that target to produce some sort of product which will be transported to Germany or to Austria or, or to Western markets. Uh, Hungary made notable efforts to position itself as the gateway to the European Union for companies coming from the East. And besides its uh, favorable uh, geographic location, the country can offer the political and economic stability uh, of being a European uh, Union member state. So one part, this was one of uh, the cornerstones of, uh, of our competitiveness <coughs> in FDI uh, attraction. And the second cornerstone was undoubtedly uh, the cost-effective cost labor pool. So when it comes to um, site selection for FDI projects, the availability of qualified and cost-effective uh, labor pool uh, is always high on the agenda. Um, today, wage differences are still remarkable compared to, to Western European countries. However, Hungary and other countries in the region were already reporting historic low unemployment rates before the outbreak of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And at this point, we arrived to, uh, to the list of challenges uh, that were already affecting this FDI attraction uh, model before, uh, before the crisis. Uh, Suahiro san uh, mentioned uh, what uh, were the main challenges for Japanese companies uh, when selecting a new uh, FDI site. And if I'm not mistaken, labor cost increase was in the first place and uh, securing human resources was in the third. Uh, so this was already an, uh, an issue in Hungary with a background of uh, negative demographic trends. Uh, we have an aging population similarly to, to other uh, Western European countries. And last but not least, here we can mention also the consequences of automatization. Uh, here I refer to, to the trends of Industry 4.0, which is uh, at the same time a challenge and an opportunity for every manufacturing hub like, like Hungary. We have to get prepared for, for a completely new era of, uh, of manufacturing. And the COVID-19 crisis added one item to this uh, list of challenges, let's say. Uh, we can see uh, the accelerated changes of global and regional supply chains, partly uh, due to, to technological changes, partly due to the uh, increased need for, for more flexibility, for more resilience uh, regarding the supply chains. And our country has to, uh, to adopt its uh, value proposal uh, to these uh, changes. Um, last year, China was the number one source of new FDI projects announced in Hungary. And if you hear only this information, this can be misleading because it was the first time in the last decade that China was uh, in the number one uh, place. Uh, South Korea and Japan has been ahead of China in that terms uh, in the recent past. <clears throat> we all know that there is a lot of, uh, let's say, media noise around Chinese investments. Some Western European politicians say that China occupies Central and Eastern Europe uh, via investments. Uh, in the table, you can see the figures that speak for themselves. I think it's quite meaningful that even India has 
a higher FDI stock in Hungary uh, than China. Uh, anyway, these figures are from uh, 20, uh, 2018. And you can also see uh, uh, in this table that uh, Western countries still have a much higher uh, FDI stock in Hungary than, uh, than Asian nations. Japan uh, was in 2019, or as of 2019, uh, the number one uh, Asian greenfield investor uh, in Hungary. However, this position uh, may change soon, as uh, one of the latest news were that uh, Korean battery uh, manufacturer SK Innovation uh, announced uh, the largest greenfield investment projects in Hungary's history. So surely uh, South Korea will overtake Japan in this, uh, this category. Uh, now a few, few words about why Japanese companies uh, choose Hungary as an investment location. Uh, Suahiro Sam has talked a lot about that. Uh, I would underline only one item from this list, the quick access to customers in, in Western Europe. And also we have some examples for that. Uh, Japanese companies uh, gained uh, possession over their hunger operations uh, via acquisitions. Um, as of January 2021, there were 180, so 89, uh, Japanese companies operating in Hungary with an aggregated uh, employment of more than 33,000 people. Again, just to compare, Chinese companies employ 15,000 people altogether in Hungary, so less than the half uh, of the Japanese uh, level. So who are these uh, companies? In this slide, you can see uh, the largest Japanese investors in Hungary, so not, it's not a full list anyway. But there are a few characteristics uh, that worth mentioning. You can notice the absolute dominance uh, of the automotive industry, automotive suppliers, and one uh, large OAM, it's uh, Suzuki, it's a well-known story that uh, Suzuki was one of the first global companies to choose Hungary as a manufacturing location in the early 1990s. And besides Suzuki, we have Bridgestone, we have NHK Spring, Denso, Ibiden, Toyo Seat. They are all automotive companies. And uh, uh, Shinwa, Mitsubauer, Diamond Electric, they all uh, represent the electronic sector, but they are also supplying their products to the motor, automotive industry. So the first and most important characteristics of Japanese FDI in Hungary is it's the, it's the huge dominance uh, of automotive. However, uh, it is not restricted to uh, only this uh, single sector, uh, as Japanese FDI is a bit more diverse in Hungary than that. Uh, we have Zoltec, uh, a chemical company. It's uh, owned by Torre Group, uh, which is a large Japanese conglomerate. We have Nissin Foods, uh, in catch it, it's a, it's a Japanese company active in the food industry. And we have uh, uh, the famous uh, automotive company Nissan that operates a, a shared service center in Budapest. This center was established in 2017 and uh, supervises another service center uh, of the company in India. And together these centers uh, provide full accounting services for the subsidiaries of, of Nissan all over uh, Europe. And beyond the dominance of automotive companies, another interesting uh, feature is the geographic location of Japanese companies within Hungary. Uh, a large hub is the northwest, um, southwest direction uh, from Budapest, so namely Toto, Totobanya, Esztergom, uh, Komáron, Székesfehérvár. These cities are all uh, in the proximity of, of major transportation routes and, and the highway system that leads towards uh, Germany, towards uh, Austria, so the western uh, borders uh, of Hungary, uh, where the number one customers or the final customers of these Japanese companies uh, are located. And another uh, developing hub that worth mentioning is the northeastern uh, part of our country, uh, namely Mishkots and its proximity. You can see the logos of, of GSUSA, of Xinhua, and uh, and we had another Japanese companies in that location uh, called Takata, producing safety systems for automotive, but this company was acquired by another multinational, so it uh, doesn't uh, count to be a Japanese uh, investor uh, anymore. And uh, I think we can perceive an ongoing uh, commitment from, from Japanese investors. And the latest signs of that was uh, in this year, January, then so Alpine and, and Diamond Electric announced to develop their Hungarian sites 
in a total value of uh, 6.5 billion Hungarian for it, despite the COVID crisis. So I think uh, this, is a, this is a great uh, achievement. And in order to continue this uh, success story, uh, surely some challenges have to be addressed. I've already talked about uh, the availability of skilled labor, uh, of IT professionals, engineers. Uh, uh, so um, um, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge for the country to, to, to provide this, this, uh, this environment for, for not only Japanese investors, but uh, for FDI projects in general. And some Japanese uh, companies have already started to bring uh, Industry 4.0 related technologies uh, to Hungary. A good example for that is Suzuki, that has some smart manufacturing uh, uh, technology in Estergom or Bridgestone that implemented uh, AI-based uh, technology to its plant in, in Tatabanya in, in Hungary. So our country has to provide a, a supportive environment for, for, for these, these trends. Uh, and as, I as I've mentioned at the beginning, uh, that the golden combination of being a favored geograph ge geographic location plus offering a cost-effective labor, so this, uh, this model was already pressure uh, before the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So as we enter a new era of manufacturing, this requires a new base of competitiveness and, and uh, Hungary has to, has to work uh, on that. So how uh, Japanese FDI can fit into Hungary's uh, strategic interests in terms of uh, FDI attraction? The number one point is here uh, is diversification. I think uh, the current pandemic proved again that there are more crisis-proof industries and these sectors should be uh, in the focus of investment promotion in the future, at least partly. And more Japanese FDI inflow in these sectors can, can, uh, can contribute uh, to, this, to achieving this goal. And even, even if this, uh, uh, this diversification succeeds, uh, the significance of automotive industry for surely will not uh, diminish in the, in the Hungarian economy. Uh, and as the sector goes through a major transformation, the Hungarian automotive industry has to keep up with these changes. Uh, so e-mobility related FDI projects are mostly welcome. Uh, uh, Suahiro san mentioned uh, green economy. Um, um, so Japanese investors can contribute a lot uh, in this aspect as well. And last but not least, uh, it's a strategic goal uh, of the Hungarian economy to move up in the global value chain. So to attract FDI projects of higher added value, R&D, high-tech manufacturing, shared service centers of complex uh, activities, again, uh, the cooperation between the Hungarian government and, and Chinese investors can be can be fruitful uh, in the future. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion. Thank you, thank you, uh, Peter. Uh, just as an uh, extension of, of your slide, please allow me to share this slide, which is which I found on the on the embassy's website, but it is seemingly originally uh, made uh, by a Japanese organization. Here you can see probably better the geographical distribution of the of Japanese companies active in Hungary. And uh, I would like to use this opportunity. So uh, actually it, it is quite good that we were talking about the producing facilities in Hungary because uh, uh, a, a bit unusually, I would like to start with a question uh, from, what, uh, from one of our attendees. And uh, he's asking uh, Andras Lenki uh, that, uh, that uh, it's, a, or it's a kind of comment and question that uh, besides of the manufacturing uh, uh, facilities, uh, uh, factories, it is rather rare to see financial and general trading companies expand their business here in Hungary. What do you think uh, is the cause of this? Uh, uh, what uh, what uh, do you think is the cause of this? And what could Hungary and the region as an extension to do uh, to be more attractive for Japanese shared service centers? Our panelists can see this question in the chat. I would like uh, to know your opinion uh, or expectations. Uh, as, as in my opinion, uh, that would be the next step, uh, the, the next stage of the economic cooperation when not only the manufacturing companies are investing in our region, in Hungary especially, 
but uh, representatives uh, and flagship companies from the service sector. And we know very well that the, the service sector and the financial sector in Japan is really robust. And um, I will have another comment, but I will uh, raise it uh, later. So please uh, feel free to, to add your, uh, your thoughts and comments and, and answers. And it is not obligatory for all of you, so only those who are interested in uh, responding this question, please. Um, okay, I, I will start. Uh, uh, to be absolutely frank, I don't know the exact reason why uh, we don't have more Japanese shared service centers in Hungary. Uh, so there was a first big wave of uh, SSCs coming to Hungary starting around 2006. And there was another big wave um, around the middle of the last uh, 10 years. And uh, to some extent, Budapest and its proximity became a bit overheated in, in, in certain uh, aspects, especially in the labor part uh, of the story. Um, as for the future in general, uh, a shared service center requires uh, office space and infrastructure. Of course, the COVID-19 has uh, had some effect on, on, on the operations of shared service centers as well, because most of the colleagues were sent home uh, to work uh, through, through home office. So maybe uh, the availability of office space will not uh, have a such significant, uh, will, not, will not be a such significant uh, uh, decision factor when locating a new SSC. However, the availability of, of uh, language speaking, young uh, workforce will remain, I think, uh, the key uh, factor. And if uh, Hungary can be, can be uh, or remain competitive in that terms, then I don't see any main obstacle uh, that we why not cannot attract more uh, chi uh, Chinese, sorry, Japanese uh, SSCs to Hungary. Maybe more proactive investment promotion in, in that terms in, in Japan can, can also help to, to improve uh, the situation in this term. Thank you. Thank you. Um, only, only at this, this is not a new idea, actually, that what is wanted to em emphasize as well. So uh, usually we have those kind of uh, students who speak, for example, foreign languages, Asian languages, and they are much involved in literature, etc., etc. And we have those students who, who are more involved in business studies, that there's so rarely that we can find the, these two kinds of skills in one person. And that's what we need in order to set up these kind of shared services. This is the same idea. So language and even culture. So cultural uh, skills and, 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 uh, and experiences are also needed, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Any co any comments uh, from our? Well, thank you very much. Uh, may I uh, take up this subject? Uh, uh, why uh, the Hungar Hungarian companies are not really uh, present uh, in Japan, uh, seemingly a little bit uh, absent, or why Japan cannot uh, get into uh, uh, Hungary uh, with the uh, in more investment? I think. I, I can certainly associate uh, myself with Peter. Uh, he mentioned about uh, more robust sort of efforts uh, of uh, uh, making uh, Japanese companies, uh, uh, you know, aware of the possibilities of uh, uh, Hungary uh, as uh, you know the production site, uh, because of the, all the merits that uh, Peter has just mentioned. So. Um, I think more robust sort of uh, uh, public relation exercise to boost uh, the popularity of Hungary uh, in terms of uh, destination for Japanese investment. Uh, at the outset of my uh, presentation uh, uh, a little while ago, I mentioned about uh, Brexit and uh, uh, maybe, you know, the uh, Japanese companies uh, now present in UK, they are losing appetite in uh, investing more in the United Kingdom. So uh, they might be very much attracted uh, to uh, 
uh, uh, you know, invest uh, more on the continental side uh, of uh, EU member states, particularly uh, Central and East European uh, countries. Uh, that those are the members to European Union. So uh, I think it is a great, uh, you know, opportunity, uh, windows of opportunity open to uh, Hungary. And I hope that, uh, you know, Hungary will, you know, will not miss this opportunity. Um, having said that, I, I also uh, want to just mention that, uh, you know, Hungarian uh, position within the European Union, that matters very much too. So, uh, you know, now, uh, you know, Japanese uh, uh, business elites, they are aware of the fact that uh, Hungary and to some extent Poland, uh, you have some problems with uh, Brussels, that really matters a little bit, you see. So uh, I hope that you would have a stable uh, political uh, situation, uh, relationship with Brussels. Uh, that is also quite an uh, important element when Japanese business elites start to think about the, the destination of their investment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, from my position, uh, the many Japanese companies also who made uh, outsourcing of the shared service center facilities, but uh, basically they are now coming. Uh, they are coming to the China. Uh, Peter said that uh, many Chinese companies uh, hiring easily to uh, the Japanese speakers. So the language issues when they uh, outsourcing the uh, finance activities. Uh, they also have to submit a document in Japanese. So uh, this is rather uh, useful or the eff uh, efficient for the Japanese company to do. Uh, ask the outsourcing like this uh, company who can provide uh, the Japanese style information. So uh, when, how do we uh, attract the Japanese company to come to Hungary or the Eastern and Central European countries uh, in this uh, SSC uh, facilities, maybe he will provide. Uh, but uh, in China, uh, this century, so very rapid uh, growing of the labor costs. So many Japanese companies are also looking for the uh, next uh, next one from China. So, but uh, basically, they are now coming to the Vietnam. So when we ask uh, the Japanese company to attract to the Hungary is maybe we will provide the uh, language issues and also a good uh, service uh, providing uh, some, some set uh, to the Japanese company, then uh, we're available. But uh, basically many Japanese companies are looking for this region as a uh, producing production uh, site. So in this case, rather, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, said that uh, these uh, sectors are the next or second or third step, I suppose. Thank you. You are muted. Yeah, thank you. Um, meanwhile, we got another question, but uh, I would like to raise mine uh, first, especially I'm targeting with my question our, our Japanese uh, panelists uh, because uh, as I as I mentioned uh, service sector could be a kind of uh, upgraded activity in in the uh, in the economic cooperation between Japan and Hungary but that is another uh, another opportunity or another uh, segment of, of the export uh, of the Japanese export and investment uh, in the world and especially in Europe and this is, uh, this is the quality infrastructure. I know very well that this is one of the main priorities of the, of the Japanese uh, export promotion and investing uh, activities to, to provide the very advanced uh, infrastructure uh, technology for the world. And uh, for sure, not only in the developing uh, countries, uh, but also it can be interesting for Europe. I mean, uh, the opportunity uh, of, of, of uh, quality infrastructure export to Europe. But what is your opinion? Is it uh, sometime in the future possible uh, to make some deals in, not only in Hungary, but in the region, let's say, when it comes to, to different uh, uh, green uh, industrial facilities 
um, or uh, even uh, rapid drain uh, construction uh, works. Thank you. Uh, yes, in my position, uh, this is a very uh, prospective uh, sectors that we, we mean Japanese and Japan and Hungary will be cooperate because uh, you have the Zara zone and uh, also the nation itself will promote the EV uh, automobiles. And Japan is now starting uh, this uh, changing our mind to, to shifting from the authentic car manufacturing to the next stage. So oh, this is a very good uh, key industry that uh, we will make a cooperation. Uh, so oh, my maybe this that is my task that uh, we I have to uh, submit what kind of support or collaboration does Hungary and Japan will do. And these kind of information is very necessary because unfortunately in Japan, uh, the very few information are spreading in Japan about Hungary's information that's spreading in Japan, uh, just the Eastern or Central Europe. So we will provide the more concentrated and detailed information to the Japanese uh, entities, business societies. This is the first step. And uh, uh, recently, uh, many companies are invested in the Poland, uh, the, uh, the west, uh, southwestern region. Uh, very close to the uh, Czech and uh, poor, uh, Germany, but uh, they also uh, steadily and uh, rapidly increasing the labor cost. So they are now looking for the other region. It means Hungary. So I've already just I just stay in Hungary two months, but uh, already have uh, several uh, questions about the information for investing in Hungary. So it means we will provide the information and then. Uh, we will uh, accelerate uh, the business between both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I uh, take the floor again? Um, well, yes. uh, in the field of uh, infrastructure, and you particularly mentioned the quality uh, or qualitative infrastructure, I think Japan can uh, certainly contribute uh, to the bilateral relations uh, between your country and Japan. Uh, for instance, uh, the uh, uh, electric trains, uh, you know, the servicing now between San Pankland uh, in the UK and, you know, Eurotunnel, uh, or between San Pankland and Heathrow and other Gatwick and all those uh, uh, airports, uh, uh, the, uh, that have been servicing uh, w with uh, Japanese Hitachi-made uh, uh, trains. And uh, uh, they not only provide, uh, Hitachi not only provide uh, the, the wagons, train wagons, but also the entire uh, safety system. And uh, uh, that would certainly uh, something that uh, uh, they could contribute in the making of a railroad, uh, railroad system uh, in Hungary. And also the smart grid uh, is also another thing that uh, uh, we are selling to uh, some Latin American countries like Chile. So uh, uh, the infrastructure building is a certainly very promising area that uh, J uh, Japan and uh, Hungary can develop further more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please, John. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, only one idea. So when speaking of in infrastructure development, especially railroads, I think it's a very good idea. At the same time, we should think in terms of Central Europe or Eastern Europe. So this north-south uh, connectivity is extremely weak in uh, Central Europe. It, it is much more difficult to get from Budapest to Warsaw than to go from uh, or fly from uh, Budapest to Amsterdam or London. So I think this is something where we have potential for cooperation. Thank you. Thank you indeed, uh, this is my opinion too. I would like to ask whether you have any question to each other or to the, to the topic, any comments before we start uh, another question from the audience. Me? No, I mean uh, you, all of you, <laughs> the panelists. Yeah. I mean. Whether you have uh, questions uh, to each other or comments uh, to, to our topic, order. 
May I, uh, Mr. Chairman, if uh, yeah. you allow me, I'd like to ask one question. Uh, how do you distinguish uh, Japanese uh, possible contribution and Chinese uh, possible contribution to your economy? How do you distinguish what Japan could provide and what China could provide? Thank you. It's a good question. Chaba or, or Peter, are you willing to to make uh, an answer on it or? One, uh, one question from my side uh, is that, as I've mentioned in my presentation, it's a core uh, goal of the Hungarian economy to move up uh, in the value chain. And uh, as we have more uh, significant Japanese investors in Hungary already, than Chinese. Uh, if you want to attract more R&D, uh, well, R&D FDI usually doesn't arrive as a greenfield. So in most cases, those companies that have a very established presence do some manufacturing for years and building on that positive um, experience, they also bring some, some advanced technology or, or higher added activities or, or research and development to that given site. And in, in this perspective, I think we have a better chance to see more uh, really quality FDI, R&D, and et cetera, et cetera, from Japanese, from existing Japanese investors in Hungary uh, than their Chinese counterparts. Uh, yeah. Yes, please, Chaba. You are muted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, so as we as as I pointed out in my uh, presentation, so the positive side is is that we don't have any debates or there are no discussions, yeah, and this is absolutely positive in the long run, yeah. That's why we can build a, a long term relationship with 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 uh, Japan. At the same time, so we we also must include and welcome. Uh, Chinese capital, regardless of manufacturing or research and development, because uh, these uh, asymmetric dependence we have on Western European companies can only be solved by 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 using this strategy. So th th this is the East Eastern opening uh, strategy of Hungary is about. It is not about China. It is not about Japan, but about diversification, definitely. Uh, so. But I agree with, with Peter as well. So when it comes to the uh, details, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as, as Peter also mentioned, uh, the, the Chinese investments until now are, let's say 90% uh, uh, takeovers. So no greenfield investment we could uh, observe in the, in the past, uh, let's say 15 years. Uh, the largest, the largest uh, acquisition of the, of the Wanhua group was uh, the takeover of Borshotkem. But I would like to note that Borshotkem, uh, one of the largest industrial facilities of Hungary, it was sold not by Hungarian owners and not by the Hungarian uh, government, but by the Austrian owners. Uh, so this is also the typical story when China is seeking for technologically intensive companies or for those companies where there is an oligopolistic market, because this uh, petrochemistry factory in Hungary, uh, uh, Suahiro san knows it uh, really uh, good, I think, the Borshot Chem uh, in, in uh, north of Mishkolc. It is uh, one of the largest uh, supplier of different uh, plastic products, uh, of plastic based products for the automotive industries. In certain uh, products, they have a, a market share of, let's say, number two or number three in Europe, or probably in the world. I, I, I don't know exactly this, uh, this, uh, this uh, factory. Only recently, we can see, and especially in connection with the e-car uh, or e-mobility uh, uh, industries, let's say, battery production or different parts of batteries uh, for electronic uh, vehicles, we can see greenfield investments by Chinese companies. But the first greenfield investment was initiated 10 years ago. Uh, that was this uh, citronic acid uh, factory in Solnok and still not completed after 10 years. So uh, probably this change in the technology of the automotive industry gave a push for the Chinese uh, 
uh, companies too, uh, and probably they are giving up or they have to give up the, their strategy on taking over technological uh, companies in Western Europe. If you see the investment numbers or, or of, of Chinese companies, or uh, I wouldn't say private companies, uh, just, uh, just uh, Chinese companies, uh, then tens of billions of euro they spent only in Germany and in France uh, or Italy on taking over uh, huge companies like, like KUKA, uh, German company for robotic industry uh, several years ago. So uh, this is a, a real difference that uh, Japanese and even Korean companies are doing uh, greenfield investments uh, in Hungary and Chinese uh, companies until now they are doing takeovers uh, buying uh, or uh, acquiring um, uh, existing uh, companies. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you yeah. very much indeed for your explanations and replies from the respective uh, uh, panelists uh, on this uh, panel. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to just uh, uh, draw your attention to the very fact that uh, China itself uh, is very much interested in joining the comprehensive and progressive TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. And this has been mentioned uh, by the uh, uh, Xi Jinping himself. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we should, uh, how we should interpret this, uh, these signs. Uh, this is very important. I mean, the, uh, because in TPP, we have a, a chapter dedicated to discipline the conduct of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. So if uh, China is really interested in getting into TPP, then they have to you know, come across with uh, some requirements stipulated in the existing TPP chapter on uh, disciplines for the uh, uh, state-owned enterprises. So this is very important moment. If China could join TPP, that means that they cleared all those requirements. Uh, this could be very good, not only for uh, Japan, not only for all the rest of the TPP members, it should be good for rather progressive school of thoughts in China. And also, uh, you know, that will benefit the uh, our European friends as well. Thank you. Muted. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, we have a, a technical, I think, a kind of technical question. Uh, probably, Suedo San is is the is the most uh, appropriate person to answer it. Um, Mr. Uh, Shandor Jok uh, asked uh, that we are a company representing Japanese uh, special products brands used by Japanese manufacturers in automotive and electronic industries. Since these products are not easy to find in Europe for just-in-time supply, our question is what is the platform or way to inform the Japanese-owned companies about the opportunity to locally source the usual qualified validated products? I think it is a kind of Jetro and HIPEA uh, uh, question, uh, a rather technical <laughs> We have some time, so uh, if, if you know a right answer, please, <laughs> please advise uh, this company. It actually, Jetro is now providing the platform, uh, so-called Japan Street and Japan uh, Japan Mall. Uh, Japan Mall is the how can I say the end-using items, and then Japan Street is uh, how can I say the uh, B two B items. But uh, according to his question, rather difficult to answer to him. How can I do? But anyway, uh, it is available to provide these kind of information. So what do they need? What, what do you need? And then uh, this inquiry will dispatch the headquarters and then spread uh, into the Japanese or local offices. And then uh, collecting this information to provide this company. This is available. But uh, rather, uh, this is the just-in-time supply is rather difficult. Probably, uh, it, if it is going about about Hungarian uh, opportunities, then uh, probably the company could uh, could approach the Hungarian Investment Promotion Agency and or the Hungarian Export Promotion Agency, as they have the appropriate uh, lists and data sets uh, for for the, the for the qualified 
uh, companies who are eligible to, uh, to make supplies for these uh, systems. Thank you. Yeah, but many, anyway, uh, if uh, they will contact with me, with us, uh, Jetro Budapest, uh, we can uh, discuss with him or with them, and then uh, we'll have uh, some ideas uh, in the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, now I can see any questions from the audience by the attendees. I would like to ask uh, our panelists whether you have a kind of final comments or, or question related to the topic. If not, then we have to close the session. Okay, then. Thank you very much for, for everybody uh, to have you here. Uh, I think uh, this discussion was really interesting and contributing a lot uh, to understand and to develop the Hungarian and uh, Japanese uh, economic cooperation. And uh, I would like uh, I would like to uh, announce uh, in this way to our panelists and to our attendees that next Friday we will have the, the discussion with the same topic, almost the same topic, but focusing on the Visegrad countries and uh, Japan's economic cooperation. Uh, it will be a really interesting discussion too, so uh, please uh, register uh, for this event too, uh, after we announce it in the coming days. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank I really you. enjoyed our discussion and uh, we, I do hope that we will meet not only uh, virtually, but also in person in Budapest or in Japan. And uh, we noted your, your, uh, your sign uh, that you have never been in Hungary, Professor Vatanan. <laughs> For Thank sure you. we will create an occasion uh, to have <laughs> you here after after the the uh, these uh, hard times will be over. Thank you yes, very much. Yes, indeed. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It Thank was you. a pleasure. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye now. Take Bye. care. Bye. Thank you.